Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode number 13 of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Today, I'm featuring indie author Elizabeth Ann West, and it's a special episode because the book is not the only thing speaking. (laughs) Elizabeth is speaking as well. We're instituting a new segment, an author interview. I'm extremely excited. This is my first ever author interview. I'm pretty green. It's pretty obvious. (laughs) Bear with me. The interview is pretty lengthy because Elizabeth has all kinds of valuable insights um, and some really cool anecdotes. So I really hope you enjoy this. I had a blast speaking with her and recording this interview. I thought it was just a lot of fun. Uh, Before we get to that, I want to make a couple of short announcements. The first is that my title totaled A Starship Fairfax prequel story is now free on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and Smashwords Direct. So if you are into science fiction at all, or if you're just enjoying the show and you want to support me and what I'm doing, you'd be doing me a huge favor if you go and you grab a copy of that to boost it in the rankings. Um, (laughs) And hey, if you like it, leave me a review. Always looking for that, as all of us are. Um, And the second announcement, I just want to read off some of the authors we have coming up over the next couple of weeks here on the show. Those will be Stella Wilkinson, Adarin Wood, and Alan Peterson. So it's going to be really cool. We've got some um, YA, I guess it's called Chick Lit, Romantic Lit. Um, We have some real, like, fantasy fantasy. And we have a thriller coming up which is a new thing for me. So that's going to be really exciting. And then stick around because um, mid-July, we're going to be doing some more World War II historical fiction. Uh, So that's going to be a lot of fun. I want to remind you all, if you're an author interested in being featured on the show, do reach out and contact me at benjamindouglasbooks at gmail.com. I'm currently booking um, for August and September. I've got a lot of open space Love to have some interesting people on, like we have today with Elizabeth Ann West. Uh, Elizabeth and I both introduce her a bit in the interview, so we're going to cut right to that now. This is my interview with Elizabeth Ann West, followed by a very short reading uh, for length um, from the first chapter of To Capture Mr. Darcy, a Pride and Prejudice variation novel by Elizabeth Ann West. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy the interview and the reading. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Good. Uh, Thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. I know we had some tech trouble. I really appreciate your patience and that you really did the bulk of the work (laughs) figuring it out while I sort of sat here on my hands. Thank you. You're a wonderful human being. I appreciate that very much. I like to Uh solve problems. They're puzzles. That's good. Yeah. And I can see from your um, Amazon author bio that you are tech inclined. So I'm going to start as I always do by reading that bio for our listeners. This is Elizabeth Ann West. A Jane of all trades, mistress to none, Elizabeth Ann West is the author of six novels and nine novellas, 14 of which are story variations of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Her books have won Reader Conference Awards and hit the historical bestseller lists on Amazon, Kobo, and the iBookstores multiple times. A lover of all things geeky, Elizabeth Codes websites, dabbles in graphic design, and is always looking for new technology to learn and master. (laughs) A Navy wife and mother of two, her family has lived all over the United States, currently residing in upstate New York. 
originally from Virginia Beach, Virginia, you can keep up with Elizabeth on Twitter at EAWWrites and on her website, ElizabethAnnWest.com, where she posts new fiction as she writes it. On fanfiction.net, her stories can be found under user elizabethann.west.7. And Elizabeth is extremely proud and honored to have a winter wrong win Best Novella and Best Literary Fiction in the 2015 ebook Festival of Words. Congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> Thank this you year to... I'm nominated yes, yes. for Author of the Year. Oh, great! For 2017. Yeah, with, Good for you. With Wayne Stinnett. Um, and uh, Phoenix Sullivan. So I'm truly honored just for the nomination. <laughs> yeah, that is not bad company to keep. Yeah. Uh, and then Elizabeth thanks all her readers and gives her contact information again at her website and email address. So check that out. And as always, I'll have a, a link, Elizabeth, to your website and your Amazon author page in the show notes. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah. 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 Uh, congratulations. That's great. Well, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you do aside from what we just heard, I guess. The best way to um, understand me is I grew up a Navy brat. My father was a chief petty officer in the Navy, so mm. he was gone a lot. I was the oldest of three girls. Um, I'm a tinkerer by trade, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Um, I'm, an ac I'm an accidental writer. We were moving across country. Uh, my degree is actually in political science, and we'd moved from Virginia to San Diego, and we had orders to go back to the East Coast in less than six months. So... Mm. It was the first opportunity I experienced getting a job outside of the home was really just not going to work out very well to keep up with my husband, um, who I love mm -hmm, dearly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so I clicked, I was looking to start an administrative assistant business from home because that's how I paid for college was working as an administrative assistant. And mm. I clicked on a link that said, earn money for articles. And I told myself if it was going to cost me a dime, I wasn't going to do it. And that is the now <laughs> defunct associated content, which became Yahoo Contributors Network. And they paid me $7 for my first article in 2007. And from 2007. then, I've just been a writer. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. Good for you. So you started writing copy then, nonfic. Yeah, I started off writing. Well, I guess my first writing was really fan fiction when I was younger, you know, Sequest DSV episodes, Harry Potter okay. fan fiction. Um, so I always loved fan fiction. And then... I wrote for my college newspaper. I've always been good at writing, um, and I've enjoyed it. It's just it wasn't what I got my degree in. That was my minor was English literature. So <clears throat> right. the, the article writing, I did that from 2007 until 2011, and I wrote on everything from credit card uh, management to credit recovery to short sales to solar panels. I would do the research. I would write on spec. Um, so website owners could query us to say, I need, you know, 10 articles on solar panels because maybe their website sells solar panels. So I'd write hmm. to the assignment, but then I would always write four to five articles with the same research for just various articles, figuring if there was one buyer looking for solar panels, there's going to be more buyers behind him or her uh, looking yeah, for articles. Yeah. So on a site called Constant Content, I sold over 100 articles um, and I got to set the price. So coming into fiction, I was used to making 65% on my articles, and mm. I would set the prices for anywhere between $15 to $150, depending on how long the article was and what the topic was. Sure, sure. So um, can I so just, um, <laughs> I didn't prepare to talk about this, but I'm kind of interested <laughs> now. So did, did you move out of that because you love fiction, or are you still doing that? Did you find, I don't want to get too crass and talk about the money unless you want to. No, um, it's, but, it's uh, fine. I've always talked the about the money on K-boards because I think our industry doesn't talk enough about the money. I, I don't want to do it in a uh, crass way, of course, but so often we get blinded by like sales rank and this and that, and rank doesn't pay bills. Um, how much you pay in marketing to get that rank, for example, can mean, oh, you grossed $1,000, but you spent 900 in order to get that 1000 So you really only netted $100. And the electric company wants yes. more than $100. So um, I like to talk about it in the sense that I wish we would talk about it more as a group, maybe in private or public. But um, mm. I'm sorry, I lost track of my ori your original question. It was... No, that's okay. So I, I was trying to get at the motivation for you to move away from writing articles 
writing oh. copy to to moving into fi- is is fiction more lucrative or was it like a passion diversion? I guess is what I'm asking. At the time, uh, let's see, 2007, 2000. My daughter was born in 2009, um, and. I was heavily pregnant and we were driving down the road and I was really struggling. <laughs> I was really kind of tired of writing the same articles over and over and over again. Mm. And my husband said, well, why don't you write a book? So I went to my local library and I was living in South Carolina at the time. So the local library there, great little town, but the only books that they had on like how to become an author were published in like 1970. One of them actually <laughs> said to make sure to put a Polaroid with your application that you send to agents because they want to see a picture of you. Right, a Polaroid of you. <laughs> yes. Um, so, the, the I, but I did read those books, and I did learn a good deal about traditional publishing from them. And I was about half a heartbeat away from querying agents with my first book idea, which was a romantic comedy from a male point of view. It's it's the ba- baby mama drama trope, but it was from a male um, main character's point of view. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Now I definitely realize that that is not really commercial mainstream for a traditional publisher. But at the time, I thought being unique was what was important. And Mm. I learned how the contracts are set up with advances and the percentages. And you have to understand coming from nonfiction where I'm setting my prices and I'm making 65%. Looking at a contract where I'm making 25% of the net and knowing that interesting accounting can make that net whatever they want it to be. I wasn't yeah. really looking forward to that. And then I happened to find <laughs> Joe Conrath's site. This is way early. Uh, yes. This is 2009, 2010. And yes, he did yes. a conversation. And I, I I can't remember if it's with um, Barry Eisler or Barry, or Barty Crouch. Uh, or Barry Crouch. Barty Crouch, I think, is in Harry Potter. Barty Crouch. Barry Crouch. <laughs> Barty Crouch Jr., I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> Barry Crouch. <laughs> Anyway, the the title of the article, and you can still find it, is "Be the Monkey, Not the Frog." Whatever you huh. do, do not click on the art, do not click on the video for that, because the video is monkeys use frogs to masturbate in zoos. So that's all I have to tell you for "Be the Monkey, right. Not the Frog." And but their extremely long interview was was very brash and and honest and just you know what was going on in publishing. And I realized I was lucky in the sense that I had already made my own websites. I had already written copy for SEO. I already Mm. knew Linux, Windows, Mac. I'm I'm a geek by nature. So I I already knew multiple operating systems and things like that. So making the transition to self-publishing really wasn't a transition for me at all. Hmm. So it was... It, it was more of like a, a step to the side. And I actually formatted ebooks for authors in the early, early days because I understood HTML. And back then you had to hand code it or use Juto or Sigil or Calibre. This was long before, you know, Amazon would just take a Word document. Right. You know, it's interesting. There's like a, um, there's a trend I'm noticing with, with um, some of you who got in. Uh, I call you the Conrath, <laughs> Conrath generation, because there are there are a few there are a few self published authors such as yourself. Lindsay Baroker talks about J. A. Conrath's blog a lot. Of course, that was like her catalyst moment. I think does Joanna Penn talk about it too? Yep. I'm having trouble I mean, remembering. At the, yeah. The early times, you had Conrath, you had Joanna Penn, you had what's now defunct, which is um, the self publishing guide or. The, e- the round table, e-book yeah, that's guide. Gone. No, no, not the round table. But even before the round table, um, there was a site that was run by Tanya Caps and um, uh, Dee Dee Scott that was um, oh. the guide to self e-publishing or something like that. I can't remember the exact name huh. of the site now. Um, huh. And so there were a couple, but they're gone now. And and some of those authors moved on to Trad Pub. Tanya Caps was picked up by a publisher. Others, you know, mm. their goals or, or something changed. It, it just depends. In some cases, the market left them behind. Um, it, it, it varies. Uh, I published my first book in 2011, September of 2011. I had a bad experience, which we don't have to get into. Um, and okay. <laughs> I was kind of chewed up and spit out by a big name at the time. And I worked mm. for free, which was stupid of me. But when it came time when the site was actually making money, it was all of a sudden, oh, no, I'm not going to pay you anything. So that was really mm. demoralizing. 
And then I got involved in another project with Scott Nicholson, who is wonderful. But that project just, we kind of learned, you know, as an author, you can only spend so many plates. So that project also closed down. And finally, a good friend of mine that had helped me uh, when I was kind of in my darkest days, April Floyd, she ran a site called thecheap.net, which they shared Nook books and Amazon books, and they shared indie authors for free in the very early days of oh. indie publishing. And I hooked up with her, and I started running author ads for like $5, $10, very cheap. And I ran mm-hmm. the author ad side of the house for three years. So I was a book marketer for three years while I was demoralized oh, okay. and not writing. And then in 2014, mm. uh, I tried working outside of the home for the first time in seven years, and that was a disaster and a half. So <laughs> I was demoralized again, and I was a closet Mr. Darcy fan for the last 10 years. I had been buying As are so many. fan fiction. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They are. We don't want to admit it, but now we will. Um, I I had no problem spending trad pub prices on Mr. Darcy Takes a Wife or Mr. Darcy's Daughters mm. by Elizabeth Ashton. These were all books published by New York publishers after the 2005 movie. And by right. about 2010, 2011, the movies had been out for so long, it wasn't as mainstream. And so the contract started drying up. And so all of us who are fans of this genre had to go to the forums and had to like stalk these free stories online and you would save them as a PDF (laughs) on your computer because you never knew when the site was going to get taken down. I still have like 10 files of precious stories that you can't get anywhere else anymore. (laughs) When you need your Darcy fix. Yes. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) So when 2014 came around, um, April was, uh, we were slowing down with the cheap because Amazon affiliates had changed a lot and it just really wasn't profitable as much to run a daily deal site anymore. I mean, the ebook market had, had matured. Um, and interestingly enough, KU came out that July, which we didn't mm. know, but April started editing for me and I didn't expect the books to make very much at all. I was like hopeful we could make $600 to share. And we ended up <laughs> making... $1,000 the first week the first book came out. The first week? Yes. I wrote All right. Trouble with Horses in a month. I wrote it for myself. I shed away fears that I wasn't, you know, historically accurate enough or whatever. I just wrote it as a fan of Darcy. And it's one of my best-selling books to this day. It's just a little novella. It just imagines what if Mr. Darcy fell off the horse and Elizabeth found him before the assembly, the first assembly where he insults her. And... Uh. We, we made $1,000 that first week, so I quickly wrote another book, which was A Winter Wrong, um, which won the award, and that came out that same month. KU came out. Um, we, we were off to the races. <laughs> so basically what you're saying is that uh, the rest of us should all abandon military science fiction and urban fantasy <laughs> and write Darcy fan fiction. <laughs> to be honest with is. you, I have a number of author friends that write Darcy fiction under pen names, and they use it to support their other genres. Like they'll do one in a genre that they love that maybe more is crowded and they're still working on getting a toehold in. Um, And then they write good Darcy fiction because everybody loves Pride and Prejudice. So you can't become an English, you know, literary person if you haven't studied Jane Austen. So everybody does their flavor of it or whatever. And if you write a Darcy and Elizabeth good Regency story, you'll sell between 500 and 1,000 copies your first month, no matter what the price point Hmm. is. Hmm. Well, I'm kind of curious now. You know, most of my questions I've written beforehand center around Austin, but what is it about Darcy specifically as a character? Why is he such a magnet for readers? You know... We talk about this a lot in our in our groups. Um, yeah, if you really think about it, Darcy's the original rich billionaire. He's the original Mr. Mm. Gray who has to transform. <laughs> I mean, he's not he's not doing BDSM, but he literally insults her. He's rude, and then come to find yeah, out, that, he's got all these like skeletons the in his closet, huh? <laughs> I said, that's like the British version, right? You know. <laughs> yes. Well, the 18th or the 19th century British version. Yes. Um, yes. And it's also the time period is very 
exhilarating because you have technology at that time point that is just the industrial revolution is really kicking off but we don't mm. quite have yet recording or photographs so the regency period mm. is before was right before the victorian period and the victorian period is where you start really just well it's a really long period to begin with but by the middle of the Victorian period, you've got photographs and you've got better recording of, of for historical accuracy. But I think the Regency yeah. period still has an element of fantasy about it in terms of historical yes. fiction. It might be kind of that last line because we don't have a complete historical record. So you can kind of play a little bit more with the fantasy aspect of going back in time. I like that. That, that makes a lot scholarly. of sense to me. <laughs> No, no. Well, maybe, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of illusion, um, um, mystery. There's a lot of mystery there still, isn't there? Yes. And Austin wrote, um, she really wrote like ensemble pieces, even though Pride and mm -hmm. Prejudice is focused on Elizabeth Bennett's uh, version of the story. And she's not completely a reliable narrator. Um there's still, you know, all these other great characters that that have um, pieces of what we still recognize today. Society is still society. You still have absurd people in your life. Um, so I yes. think Austin just kind of hit the magic of it's family based, which we all have crazy family. It's society based. Mm -hmm. um, and it also draws on those traditional fairy tale elements of like Cinderella, who doesn't want to be noticed by Mr. Darcy and not only have him ask you to marry him, but then you get to humble him and say no. And then you go yeah. through your transformation and he still wants you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm hearing everything. It's making sense. Um, so we've we've been talking about Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy. Would you briefly explain, just for anyone listening who doesn't know what we're talking about, what is a variation novel anyway? Because that's that's what you've got here is a variation novel, right? Yeah, there's a couple of different flavors of Jaff. Jaff is Jane Austen fan fiction. You have okay. prequels where people write before Pride and Prejudice happened. They're not as popular. You have sequels where you go with like exactly what happened in Pride and Prejudice and you're maybe writing the next generation of like Darcy and Elizabeth. Yeah, there's like a there's like a Netflix. Daughters. Yeah, there's like yes. a Netflix series or it might be a BBC series on Netflix of that, right? Mystery at Pemberley or something. Uh that is done by PD James and it's called okay. Death Comes to Pemberley. Yeah. Death comes to Pemberley. So, you know what I'm talking yep. about. Yeah. I mean, Alexander is it Alexander McCall. There's a lot of traditionally published authors who write Jeff. Uh, Curtis Settingfield. I'd have to look up her name. She wrote Eligible. I remember titles, not necessarily author names, which is awful of me. I'm sure. still kind of reader centric in that way. So Death comes <laughs> to Pemberley, Eligible. And there was a rewrite of Emma recently as well that, that was hmm. traditionally published. Um Everything's kind of turning 200 years old right now. I believe this year, 2017, is the 200th anniversary of Jane Austen's death. So that's another mm. reason why everything's really popular as well. Um, sure. And so a variation is what I call your favorite TV show never being canceled. So we all have these <laughs> pop culture fandoms that we love, whether it's Buffy or Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever it is. Right. And if you you know the fandom, everybody just wants more stories. We just want more. Mm. So a variation goes to the original timeline and changes something. A carriage accident, somebody dies, somebody gets sick, the weather changes, whatever it is, you can change mm. the storyline a little bit. You don't wanna go too drastic because then you're really not capturing the spirit of Pride and Prejudice and the characters and things. So one of my variation series, um, The Moralities of Marriage, it was my first idea ever, and it imagined, what if Georgiana was never saved by Darcy? Because I always felt it was kind mm. of a convenient throwaway that Darcy could write this letter when Elizabeth goes to Kent and is like, oh, my sister was almost lost by Mr. Wickham, and I just so happened to get there a day early and saved her. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, very convenient. A little deus ex machina, if you will. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. A little bit. Um... So I don't think Jane Austen had critique groups. <laughs> so No. <laughs> but these are the kinds of things that you can have fun with. And like I said, yeah. my very first one imagined what if Elizabeth found Darcy fallen off of his horse on his way to Netherfield Park. Yeah. 
So it's a little bit like you might, you might, I might say then for my own understanding, it's a little bit like an alternative history, but given, given the history that's fictional to the narrative. So things do change. It couldn't happen concurrently with the actual plot. Right. But you do need to keep certain canon elements, enough canon elements that, um, people can still recognize the characters in the storyline. Sure. Well, so sounds very it's almost like putting Easter eggs. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can see the appeal to that. If you, if you love Regency or if you love Jane Austen or if you just love Darcy. <laughs> yeah. I can, cer- I can I, certainly see the appeal. I think too, this is also another fantasy for me as a reader. I can't speak for other readers, but I suspect that there, there might be some truth to it. You know, when Fifty Shades of Grey went huge and everyone was talking about how this is how women, it, like Fifty Shades of Grey wasn't first. Like everybody had a Harlequin subscription when I was a kid. All of the moms on the block got the little paperbacks for 99 cents in the mail and then you ordered, you know, three more over the course of six months. I don't know if you're familiar with that program, sure. but everybody uh, who grew it, up, yes. <laughs> yeah, everyone who grew up loving romance and and, yeah. and that's I think typical for most women readers. It was it's, mm. it's it is a fantasy. We don't read romances and go, oh yes, I think Fabio is going to show up at my house on a white stallion. No, right. <laughs> it's no different than sci-fi <laughs> or military sci-fi. How that's a fantasy for other types of readers. Right. So right. with Regency, gender roles were a little bit more defined, and. Mm-hmm. I am a feminist. I don't want to go back to where I can't even have a credit card unless my husband signs on it. Nothing like that. But there is a <laughs> fantastical element to it of reading fiction, a, a relaxing aspect of it, if you will, to read characters that are not me going through a situation that's a lot easier and more defined for men and women. Hmm. Yes. Like, I get excited when Elizabeth Bennet in a Jaff story is is pregnant, and she she realizes she's missed her courses, and she's waiting for the quickening. I mean, our, our life just doesn't move that slowly anymore. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, um, we already touched on this just a little bit when we were talking about Darcy, but I wonder if you could speak to a little bit what your sort of f- the fan base that you found for these books Who's, who's reading these? So there's a couple of camps in the Jaff world. You have yeah. the first generation of Jaff readers goes all the way back to the early 1900s. That's when Georgette mm. Heyer is writing her books. Um, and there was also the first uh, Pride and Prejudice variations that were published. Um, I can't remember the titles off the top of my head, but they are listed in the, Wik- the Wikipedia listing for Jaff. Um, and then you kind of have a shortage for a while there. And I would say in the early 90s, things pick up again, especially with the BBC 1995 series came out. Yeah. Which has Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy. And I will be... Now, I, got, uh, I have to ask you, is that is that your personal favorite film adaptation? No. Or do you prefer That's the what 2000- I was about to say. Oh. oh. <laughs> I know. Oh. I go against the grain on that. Oh, no. You really do. <laughs> go on. But the thing to remember is in 1995, I was in middle school. So Hmm. I wasn't an adult woman when that version came out. I was an adult woman when I came, when 2005 came out and suddenly the storyline made sense to me as an adult woman in a way that I couldn't understand it when I had to study it in high school. In high school, I thought it was the stupidest book I had to read in AP English ever. I thought, why are we reading a book about women walking around a room to talk? This doesn't make any sense. But when you're 16, 17 in modern society, as a woman, the last thing you're thinking about is getting married to secure your future. That's not how we do things now. Hmm. But as a grown woman, I was able to understand there is a security that comes with who you're dating and who you start a life, who's your partner in life. There is there is an underlying security there. So I was able to understand the themes a lot more as a grown up. And mm. that's when the 2005 movie came out. And my personal, my, my husband is also on the shy side. So he is more like Matthew McFadden's Mr. Darcy. Okay. In the sense that he well, called my house for our first date to ask for Miss Elizabeth. He's from Texas. Um, so <laughs> see, we actually saw that movie together. It was one of our dates. Oh, okay. Um, and also, I think cinematography wise, the 2005 mm. movie makes me want to go into it. I want to step in that screen and I want to be in the English countryside. I think the 1995 mm. version is for TV and it's a little bit more claustrophobic. 
Um, it's more relationship based. I think there was yes. more romance in the 1995 version than the movie, but it doesn't matter because I want to go with Elizabeth Bennet on those walks in the field. Yes, it's very picturesque. Yes, and we are not going to talk about okay. the zombie one. No, <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> but or but, or Bridget Jones or any of that. Right. So, well, even Bridget Jones brought more people to the uh, table, and I would say Bridget Jones in the 2005 movie brought the same kind of reader a more contemporary flair if you will to their historical fiction the 1995 uh fandom typically is a little bit more um traditional so in my Mm. readership for example most of the people who are fans of the 1995 version do not read my series series is a big new thing for jeff not many writers do a series they Mm. do standalones and Mm. um the 2005 people, I think, were more willing to go with a series because they typically are younger as a demographic. They're more my age in their early 30s, yeah. um, whereas the 1995 version are are older. They're, you know, grandkids and, and, and going to retirement versus um, being actively working and looking for an escape right now from daily life. Hmm, sure. Okay. Well, um, moving toward the end a little bit, I want to ask, what's next for you? Are you working on any exciting projects? You mentioned you're nominated for uh, 2017. What is it? The author? What what are you nominated for? Uh, It is the um, it's the E Festival of Words. Julie Dawson puts it on every year. And yeah. I've, I've been on the panel a couple of times. I'm actually on the panels again this year for um, how accurate does historical fiction have to be. It's a completely online reader conference. And it's at the end of August, oh. um, the weekend of the – whenever August 24th runs, it's that weekend. It's the 25th and the 26th and the 27th of August. Um, so it's on a forum. Readers win prizes. It's a lot of fun. We play games. We, we have our panels. And – over the years, it's it's really grown in terms of how many people are involved and things like that. Um, so I was surprisingly nominated for Author of the Year. I did not expect that at all. <laughs> I don't know who nominated me, but thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's uh, it's very touching, and it, it means a lot to me that Julie puts it on every single year. So I do my best to, to give my time um, to support it or mm. with um, you know prizes and things like that. So. Okay, book-wise, I have book four of Moralities of Marriage, which is The Trappings of Marriage. It's currently being posted on fan fiction. It should come out in the month of June, and I'm going to knock on wood because it's supposed to have been coming out every month for like the last three months. It's it's kind of being (laughs) a beast here. Um, Okay. But that should come out June or July. The audiobook of The Whiskey Wedding will be coming out soon. And also, I am co-writing a book with my sister, that is a straight sequel, which I've never done a straight sequel yet. So we're doing kind ah. of a sequel of the time between um, they got engaged and when they actually got married. Because Austin kind of jumps to just like that as an epilogue in the original. Yes. So we are crafting a sequel of they are engaged. What happened after that? How did the weddings come about? So it's a lot of fun. Hmm. Mrs. Bennett is in a lot of fit of nerves and there's a lot of dress fittings and it's it's good it's good fun. sure <laughs> she knows where the best warehouses are yes yes uh <laughs> good for you what, what have you been reading lately um i just devoured uh belgravia which is um by julian fellows i'm a big downton abbey <laughs> fan and i love his writing um uh. and belgravia actually takes place a little bit it's late regency it's like it's after 1812, so it's after the Napoleonic – it actually starts with the Napoleonic Wars. The first opening scene is the um, the ball that they had on the eve of Waterloo. Hmm. And it follows kind of a family drama, which is what I like to write is family dramas. Um, I kind of take, like, the inspiration from Downton Abbey where there's so many characters because it's a great ensemble piece as well. And then um, yeah. infuse that inspiration into my – uh, my Jaff. So I do often write from the servant's point of view as well in my stories um, and, and mm. include a wider cast than just Elizabeth and Darcy. Sure, sure. Good, good. All right. Um, well, is there anything else you'd like to add or anything you'd like to share with the audience today? I think the biggest thing is as an author, um, 
analyze your own reading habits and really look at what are the books that you are one clicking so hard you know your credit card's hot because if if you're buying those books <laughs> chances are other people are buying those books and that's a good genre for you to write in because you know the tropes mm. and you know what to be expected and don't be intimidated if something only has you know a couple hundred or a couple thousand fans jeff is never going to be really number one in the kindle store but that doesn't mean it's not a genre that can't make a living for an author that's going to write a couple books a year if that makes sense yeah it, yeah it, it does it sounds like it's a niche with like super fans, right? So it, it is a niche. It's a niche of historical fiction and contemporary fiction because there's also contemporary Jaff. Um, Barbara mm -hmm. Silkstone writes Mr. Darcy's Dogs and all of her stories. She does have some Regency ones as well, but there's a lot of people who do contemporary tellings as well. Christy Rose has contemporary stuff. April Floyd has both contemporary and Regency. So there's is your you have a contemporary title. Is that is that also a uh, um, based on Austin at all, or is that just no? That was free? my first uh, go around. That was the um, contemporary romance from a male point of view. <laughs> oh, that's that's Canceled. that one. Okay, <laughs> good for you. Yeah, that's. <laughs> That's my debut novel. I should take it down. It doesn't match anything else that I've done, but I just can't do it. I just am like, no, that's the first that's the first baby. Although no, I don't look at my baby. books as babies. I'm not attached to them like that. But um, it's a good <laughs> little story, so it can it can still yep. exist out there. Um, and the other thing for other authors, craft wise, is um, I think anyone can publish, and if you just keep an eye on your bottom line and don't put too many outlays on there at the very beginning. And I'm including editing in that. Um, you yeah. know, you can use the lean business model. Michael, Michael Anderley talks about this a lot, too. Um, I'm in yes, his 20 yes. books to 50K group. I, I'm not saying put... Yeah. I'm not complete... Uh, I don't completely ascribe to everything, you know, because I have found my own way already. I'm not a newbie author. But I appreciate what sure. he's putting out there and helping lots of people with. Um, mm. So I'm not suggesting people put garbage out there. But to be honest with you... The vast majority of indie publishers I meet, they are doing their absolute best. So yeah. for, for somebody listening out there who's worrying if they're good enough, I'll tell you, you're good enough. Just put your best <laughs> effort out there because no matter what you put out there, your first novel is always going to be your first novel. And you're always going to look back on it, you know, five years, ten years mm. and go, ugh, cringe. I was really not where I'm at now. So <laughs> you just... You just have to kind of jump out of the airplane and pull the ripcord on that parachute, which is click the button to publish because right. it's a journey and you're just going to have to keep putting books out there and you're going to learn with every book that you do. Hmm. Hmm. Sage words. Yeah. Yes. So go for it. <laughs> learn by doing. Yeah. Yes. All right. Great. Well, um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for um, doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to enjoy going back and listening to it. <laughs> I think I'm going to learn. <laughs> it was my pleasure, Benjamin. I really I really had a lot of fun. I love talking shop. So, And good luck with your new site. Um, I wish it lots of success, and I will do my best to, to spread the word as much as I can. I appreciate that very much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. To capture Mr. Darcy... A Pride and Prejudice Variation Novel by Elizabeth Ann West Introduction Nature's a fickle thing. When four days of rain occur earlier in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice to trap Jane and Elizabeth Bennet at Netherfield Park, New romances, misunderstandings, and alignments are made. Volatile tempers never did well cooped up together. Not even when there's a chessboard to help pass the time. Fall in love with the romance of Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet all over again in this new variation by author Elizabeth Ann West. A stand-alone novel of over 300 pages in paperback, this story is sure to make you sigh and swoon many times over. Chapter 1 November 15th 1811. 
In the original Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennet visits Netherfield Park with her daughters, and Elizabeth remains to care for Jane. Elizabeth Bennet slipped into the library at Netherfield Park for her sixth time in three days. With her sister Jane on the mend, she could not cease her curiosity for the chessboard. As soon as Jane fell asleep, she left her sickbed to check the progression of the game with her unknown opponent. Beneath the expansive double set of windows looking out on the south side of the property sat the rosewood-carved chess set. Elizabeth spied the board on her first afternoon in the grandest estate in all of Hertfordshire. She had not meant to start a game with anyone, but resisting the urge to move a single white pawn proved to be too great a temptation. Returning a few hours later to replace the novel she had finished by Jane's side as her sister lay suffering with fever, Elizabeth stood stunned to find someone had responded in kind. Black's corresponding pawn rested two squares away from the starting line to face hers. Soon, Elizabeth found herself eager to return to the library every few hours to continue the clandestine game. The board stood deep in the throes of a true battle with Black's knight decimating her numbers. The most clever Bennet daughter carefully read the positions of her pieces and considered her options. Her mysterious opponent was of the aggressive sort, but not blinded by the taking of just any piece. She had offered up both a pawn and a knight, and the opponent did not fall distracted by the easy kill. Therefore, the only way to beat him or her was to lay a trap of the wickedest kind. Elizabeth would sacrifice her queen in four moves. Smiling to herself, she chose her move, and a calling voice from outside the library made her hastily select another novel. Perhaps a servant was looking for her, and Jane had not slept long? Either way, her bishop sat ready to take the opponent's offending knight, and she would have to wait to see the next move of her anonymous enemy. Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy of Derbyshire frowned when he noticed Elizabeth Bennet leaning over his chess game with Bingley. She had not noticed him sitting solitarily in the far corner with his book and brandy. Being a master at averting the attentions of Miss Bingley granted him an ability to turn into proverbial wallpaper when he willed it so. A swirl of the amber liquid kept him occupied as he sat, astounded the woman would dare to move the pieces of a game she was not party to. He had meant to say something, but too quickly she moved a piece, and then scurried out of the library, leaving him once more to his own company. Groaning, he finished his drink, and supposed he could set the board back to the last position. One gift he held included memorizing even the slightest glimpse of a picture. Darcy felt confident he could reset the piece she dared touch. But when he reached the board, he paused. She had not moved a piece randomly. 
she had made a very cunning move, forcing him to choose between sacrificing his knight or his rook. A knot of understanding twisted tighter in his gut. That he was already in very grave danger of more than a passing fancy with this dark-haired, bright-eyed creature was a foregone conclusion. But now he was in the thralls of a very thrilling chess match with a worthy opponent. And the worthy opponent was none other than that dark-haired, bright-eyed creature, Elizabeth Bennet. Mr. Darcy, there you are. Caroline Bingley entered the library and swiftly attached herself to his arm. Oh, bother, are you and Charles again playing that silly chess game? Upon my honor, I do not see the point in moving little wooden pieces to simulate a battle. Besides, you always win, according to him. Darcy cleared his throat and carefully studied the board. It was a fool's trap. He did not mistake the gambit. If he sacrificed his rook this early in the game, he would be limited in defensive maneuvers later to protect his king. But his knight was paramount to his plan of attack to put her in checkmate. Her. The concept felt foreign, though surprisingly pleasing to him. Could his future include many delightful afternoons at Pemberley in a challenge of wits? On the contrary, Miss Bingley, this match I may very well lose. Shall we reset it and you can teach me the particulars? Caroline Bingley batted her eyes most fetchingly and began to reach for the pieces to take them off the board, but Darcy quickly grabbed her hand. No. Hastily, he released her as he realized she took more meaning in his visceral reaction than he meant, and the look of pleasure on her face made his stomach wish to remove itself of its contents. He swallowed before making an insincere offer. It is such a lovely day. Perhaps we should take a stroll. Caroline made the unmistakable sound of a squeal and promised to ready herself presently. Darcy nodded and agreed to await her just outside, finding himself in desperate need of fresh air. Once Caroline left, he moved his knight to a more advantageous spot and exited the library and the house itself. The rook would be a shame to lose, but one cannot win a war without casualties. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash benjamindouglasbooks.wordpress.com. And of course, if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show, or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook, feel free to contact me at benjamindouglasbooks at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend. 